Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Water and Planning Network webinar, Water and Comprehensive Planning, Theory to Practice. Uh, my name is Marianne Dickinson. I have the pleasure of being the co-chair of the Water and Planning Network together with Bill Sesenick. And this is, I believe, the fourth webinar we've done in this series. And we're very pleased to have uh, members of the Water Planning Network uh, talking about uh, their programs. So just to give you a little bit of logistics here, I um, want to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you for signing up. Uh, our plan is to have this webinar be 60 minutes in length. Um, with time for questions. So we're, we've reserved an, a lot of time for you to ask questions of the speakers. Um, the audio in GoToWebinar is either through a telephone number or through your computer microphone and speakers. So if you're hearing my voice, you have figured this out. Uh, it's one or the other. If you, if you have it on both, I think it'll drive you crazy with some feedback. Um, but what I wanted to especially say is that we mute the, the audio line during the presentation because we're recording this webinar. We want to make the recording available to people who will want to see it later. As you know, this is a free webinar and we want to have the, the webinar information available uh, free of charge to people going forward. Um, but just because we've muted everybody to reduce the background noise doesn't mean we don't want you to participate. We very much want you to participate. And you can type in questions throughout the webinar as you think of them as you listen to the speakers. And what we'll do is at the end of the webinar, we will ask all the questions, we'll go in the order that they were received, and uh, you know, be sure to indicate which speaker your question is for. And, um, and let me just tell you how you type in questions. If you've not gone to go to webinar before, uh, look in the upper right hand corner of your screen. There's an orange rectangle with a white arrow. If you click on that box, it'll open up a dialog box and there is a question and answer area where you can type in uh, whatever questions you have along the way and so we really do want to encourage you uh, to do that. Um, so in the next slide we're going to show you who our wonderful speakers are today. Um, we have Bill Sesenick, who with me is the co-chair of the Water and Planning Network. He's the vice president at CDM Smith. Um, we have Aaron Rugland, uh, program manager at, for the Babbitt Center of Land and Water Policy. We have Manny Patoli, a co-city fellow and project manager with NYU, oh, I should say NYU, Marin Institute, we'll fix that. Sorry, Manny. Um, and Rachel Sanderson, who's the regional watershed coordinator uh, for the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. And then we'll finish up with Melissa Dickens, who is the strategic planning and policy manager at Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. And if you're not familiar with Hillsborough County, we put in parentheses, that's in Florida. Um, so I think we're ready to start. I'm going to pass it on to Bill uh, to give you um, a little update on the Water and Planning Network. Great. Thank you, Marianne. Um, welcome, everyone, to the webinar today. Um, I don't know, this is probably about the sixth uh, webinar we've had uh, in our series of the Water and Planning Network, and we welcome you. Um, just a little uh, information about APA's Water and Planning Network, um, the American Planning Association um, probably about seven or eight years ago, uh, decided they wanted to re-engage and revitalize their uh, water planning initiatives um, and asked uh, uh, many folks to get together and brainstorm that. And that has turned into what is now the Water and Planning Network, which if folks know about American Planning Association divisions, it's a quasi-division essentially. Um, and uh, we uh, have about 450 uh, members so far. We welcome new members. Um, and we exist as a network and not as a division so that we can avoid uh, having to charge dues um, to folks. And also, um, you know, we were trying to encourage an interdisciplinary participation. So we're looking um, to reach out to, you know, many of the other professional disciplines that interact on, on water issues to become more of a, a one water discussion and focus. Um, so you don't need to be an APA member. You don't need to pay dues. You just need to, uh, write to us at that um, email address at the bottom. We've been uh, hosting these webinars. We've also have bi-monthly newsletters approximately. They're, they they come out uh, uh, semi-regularly. Um, sometimes we do more than one a month, um, sometimes every two or three months. So if you could proceed, Maria. Great, thank you. Um, so the Water and Planning Network goals and our mission 
Um, and just to give you a brief recap, are to promote understanding about water science um, and engineering and how that integrates with the planning profession. And on the right, you see one of the uh, signature uh, publications of APA in their planning advisory service called Planners and Water. Um, and uh, if you don't have that, um, we recommend you, you uh, navigate over to APA and uh, see if you can download it. Um, we want to explore how land use affects the health and integrity of the water environment. And really, that's our one of our core missions is to look at the relationships between land use um, and health and the water environment. Um, we want to improve the skills of planners by providing best practices um, to help manage water more sustainably and equitably. And there's uh, lots of information and more will be posted on APA's knowledge base um, about best practices, um, about uh, comp plan approaches, um, and other uh, methods that will be useful to planners. Um, we want to create better connections, again, between planners and water professionals. And we want to create new mechanisms for interaction. And the Babbitt Center, and we have um, uh, Aaron on, on the webinar today, um, has just done some um, excellent new work in that regard. But we'll save that for another webinar. <laughs> um, and we want to advance planning methods that support a one water approach. So with that, I'll get out of the way and uh, turn this over to Aaron to start our, our, our technical webinar. Thank you, Bill and Marianne, and thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. Um, I'm going to be covering the theory practice of our theory to practice webinar. Um, so I will be talking primarily about this manual that I wrote and released in February of last year, incorporating water into comprehensive planning um, that took lessons learned from numerous, numerous, numerous comprehensive plans in the Colorado River Basin states and turned it into, you know, a detailing of what topics one should cover when talking about water in a comprehensive plan, um, the mechanisms folks have used to do so thus far, and things of that nature. So I'll jump into it. Next slide, please. So this is just a little introduction slide about the Babbitt Center and our work. And I put it here not only to do a little PR plug for this and show us uh, show this lovely map of the Colorado River Basin states where we have primarily worked, but to also say that the Babbitt Center is interested generally in the connection between land use and water management. And a key focus of that for us has been specifically the connection of water within comprehensive planning. Next slide. Particularly in the Southwest, we think about this in the context of the connections between land and water scarcity. Um, so of course, everywhere um, land use decisions are made that shape our water future in various ways. Uh, this happens in places, not just uh, where there are ongoing droughts and issues of water scarcity. Um, but when we think about it in the Southwest, it's primarily uh, from the lens of how development of land influences water demand after the fact, particularly in these regions where we have, you know, wide open spaces and plenty of room to continue to grow in kind of a sprawling pattern. And so the coordination of land and water use is critical to meet the current, current and future needs of our communities without growing beyond our water supply limits. Next slide. So this is, uh, I'll primarily use Colorado examples throughout this presentation, though I also um, have a slide that details the, the state of comprehensive planning among the major cities in these seven states. Um, but these are examples from two Colorado plans as to why water was important enough for the comprehensive plan and why they featured it. So on the top, we've got Glenwood Springs, who defines water as a valued aspect for the landscape and recreation. And then on the bottom, we have Woodland Park, who specifically recognizes the connection between water supply and their ability to build housing and business projects into the future. And so we just have these two dichotomies between water as a valued natural resource, which of course it is, and then explicitly recognizing the connection between water and future development, um, which of course is also a connection in all other communities as well. Next slide. 
And then these next two slides I'll speed through a little quickly because my co-presenters will talk about these in very concrete terms, but I just wanted to lay out some general frameworks for the planning process, which uh, for incorporating water into comprehensive planning, it is doubly important to coordinate across the mark departmental team to achieve this. Um, so that includes ways to better understand your water resources data, particularly for folks uh, in the land use planning side that may not be familiar with the workings of water in the community. Um, then obviously to plan for the integration of land and water and then to act on the implementation actions within your plan. Next slide. This cross-departmental team, this is just a a graphic to show the different kind of stakeholders one might invite to the table. Um, but again, my co-presenters will be talking about this in very concrete terms. So next slide. In terms of actually, you know, you're sitting down, you're ready to write it out. What do you include in your plan? So this, uh, these are topics uh, that arose from my review and analysis of several plans within the Southwest. And they occur within these three categories, primarily water management, future projections, and water efficient land use. Next slide. And so the point isn't necessarily to make sure you are checking off all of these topics, because obviously that could make for an extremely long water element or, you know, whatever the case may be. But it's to ensure that you cover um, these kind of guiding questions on the left here. And it's structured in this way for a reason. So like, Obviously the first step is to understand where water in your community comes from, how much you have, how it's used, et cetera. And especially to tie this to the public participation process to ensure that uh, local community members understand the workings of the water system, um, because depending on where you live and how complex your water provision is, you know, it may not be obvious where the water sources are. And then also to understand like the issue areas of importance to your residents and ensure that your comprehensive plan addresses any fears uh, about water management that may exist in your community. Next slide. The next uh, topic area is related to future projections. So this is extrapolating your current water management into what will happen in the future and in a comprehensive plan specifically tying that to population, housing and employment growth and your development expectations over time. The other crucial pieces of these future projections are to identify uh, your contingency plans or your options for whatever challenges may be on the horizon related to climate change uh, and to begin to plan for equitable provision of water services uh, if water equity is a problem you in your community as well. Next slide. And then tying these two things together would be this category of water efficient land use, which really identifies the strategies to move things forward. So if between your current water management and your future projections, you realize that you know there's a potential gap in your future water supplies, you may need some conservation measures uh, in order to address this gap, or you know there may be issues of flooding that you need to identify site-specific interventions to sop up uh, flood water and storm water, and I, you know, mitigate any pollutants that come with those. Uh, any of these water efficient land use categories are really about like making that connection between the water context of your community and how you can solve some of those problems through land use. Next slide. And so here's just everything together uh, once again for you. And yeah, it's just a process basically to lay out the water management, the context of your community, connect this to the future development that the rest of the comprehensive plan is tasked with identifying and defining, defining, and then identifying these water efficient land use kind of interventions or implementation points uh, to address any of the issues that come up in these first two sections of identifying the current context and future projections. Next slide. So this is a little peek behind the evaluation I did of water uh, within comprehensive planning in southwestern cities. So on the left there, you have the topics that I just covered. And on the top is the most populous and the 
capital cities of these the southern Colorado River Basin states. And so obviously that varies widely because you have like the city of Casper, Wyoming compared to uh, the city of San Jose, California. You know, very different scales we're talking about here when we say the major cities. But in any case, uh, the blue grid that you see in between is an identification of how sophisticated the community addressed the water topic or not. So a white box says they did not talk about this topic at all. A dark blue box is they talked about this in great detail. And it was clear that it was integrated into their land use planning overall. And a medium blue box would you know, be somewhere in between that. So a light blue or medium blue box is somewhere on the scale of like, we have water quality programs, period, end of sentence, no further connections to land use. Um, but I think this diagram can be interesting, you know, if you're able to spend some time looking at it, because you can see that even within the same state with the same governance, uh, folks are addressing water and their comprehensive plans very differently and to different degrees. This makes sense uh, based on local context a little bit, though you can also see the Arizona communities featured here are all in the Phoenix Valley, save for Tucson, and yet even they have very varying water in their comprehensive plans. And then between states, you can see that a lot of these really dark blue ones tend to be California, Arizona, uh, one or two Colorado ones as well. And then the other ones uh, tend to be the medium blue or the light blue. Next slide. Um, so as I finish up, I just wanted to make a point about uh, doing a water element versus incorporating water throughout the plan. And I think in short, the answer is to do both. So water elements provide a dedicated section to tackle all things water. If elements as a plan format seems a little outdated to you, I think this is still true, but you would just incorporate it as a water chapter within like a sustainability focused area or something similar. And then water should be included into other elements and policies as appropriate. And so I have two additional Colorado examples here. Um, so on the top, we have RICO here connecting water service to their annexation and upzoning policies. And on the bottom, we have Aurora uh, uh, protecting wetlands from development encroachment. Next slide. So in conclusion, this is just a pitch for the comprehensive plan to provide a mechanism to reinforce your community's water management strategies and specifically to use the plan to tie water to urban form, the future land use map, and major policy goals. Uh, the topics I covered demonstrate that a plan should provide an overview of water management, connect this to your future projections about development, and then identify the ways to integrate water into land use processes, standards, and decisions so that uh, land use can be a helpful uh, tool for addressing any water management challenges you may have. And then doing all of this will enable a local government uh, to move forward with a sustainable water future while getting the community buy-in of the public participation process of the comprehensive plan. Next slide. So a lot of these points are summarized in this manual, uh, a pitch here, this uh, link is the shortened one that will take you right to it. And I am always happy to talk to folks about this as well. But for now, I will turn it over to Manny and Rachel for their presentation. Great, thank you, Erin, and thank you for the, the awesome segue into um, our presentation uh, for Rachel and myself, um, Meandering Paths, Watershed Governance in Louisiana. Um, so just a little, a little bit of brief background. Um, although right now I'm working in, in community and urban development, there is a strong connection of, uh, as, as Aaron just highlighted, of the community got buy-in, the participatory approach, and the, the uh, overall concept of governance when it comes to comprehensive planning. Um, in my previous work of work uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Brazil, a lot of the comprehensive plans post-90s uh, um, democratic revolutions, a lot of these plans did a strong, strong, had a strong emphasis on this uh, governance and participatory process as a result of the Dublin Principles from 1992 
that uh, that introduced the concept of integrated water resources management. And as we're looking as we're looking at these comprehensive plans today, uh, we're looking at it, the, the the evolution of that into the idea of one water here in the U.S. as well as sustainable urban water management. Um, and just to to understand of how a person from New York met a person from you know South eastern Louisiana, Rachel can correct me on the geography of that, um, was a, a, a common uh, research project that was being conducted uh, by Professor Tracy Birch out of LSU and their uh, Inland from the Coast research project that took place in the fall of 2020, in which um, Rachel and I started having a side conversation during the webinar about um, the, the governance process and how uh, what are some best practices that I had from the European, uh, from the international concept uh, context? Um, next slide, please. And then, as you can as you can see, um, as we started talking a little bit more and more, um, th there are a lot of idiosyncrasies. There's a lot of complexity that makes it more complicated um, for for governance in in any uh, watershed area. So. Um, for the, for the further details of the planning and the, that process, I'd like to hand it off to Rachel Sanderson. Rachel? Thanks, Manny. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so what you're looking at here, and I want to give special credit to Dr. Thomas Dalfit and Lindsay Lamana, who are at LSU, is specifically a map that um, shows all of these different plans that exist across Region 7 of the Watershed Initiative. And so you'll notice that um, there are some hubs in the upper left-hand corner where those are state documents. Uh, the pluses are actually going to be our regional documents, and you'll notice that each of these different planning processes are connected to that. Can you click once for me, Liam? Thank you. Uh, but what we notice is that all of these parish planning processes are actually separate from one another. So without that vertical integration uh, or incentive from the state or regional actor to be able to incentivize interjurisdictional collaboration and coordination, our systems and the way that we think about watershed management and planning in general is, is largely disconnected from one another. So there's um, not necessarily a lot of horizontal integration between different organizations or public entities without the incentive from the vertical alignment. Next slide, please. Go ahead and click one. And so in a place like Louisiana, it's not surprising, I'm sure, to anybody. Um, what you're going to see are, are a series of dots that are going to pop up for different flood events over time. So um, you'll notice the 1983 flood. Some of you are familiar with the floods of 2016 in Baton Rouge. That's the exact same riverine system that flooded in 1983 <clears throat> as flooded in 2016. So next slide, please, and then click once. And so it's not surprising <laughs> that um, to Louisiana that we've we've been experiencing major flood impacts over time. In particular, the one that I want to pull out for today is from 2016. So the Great Floods of 2016, 56 of Louisiana's 64 parishes had a federally declared disaster because of flooding. At that moment in time, our governor, uh, who is still our governor at this point in time, Governor John Bell Edwards, said we cannot continue to live like this. We need to further interrogate what our role is with water uh, with respect to the same state of best practices planning and land use development. Uh, we actually received an initial investment of $1.2 billion in community development block grant funds um, to be able to start the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. And so just want to clarify that I am one of the eight regional watershed coordinators. This is a regional approach I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and I don't think that anybody's a stranger <laughs> to the fact that 2024 uh, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast in particular was challenging uh, from the, the perspective of hurricanes. So we, in, ex in Louisiana, we experienced Cristobal, Marco, Laura, Delta, Zeta. There were also May flood events. And also we were dealing with Mississippi River flood. Next slide, please. And we definitely know that over time, we're going to have a future with even more water. Uh, so what you see on the lower left-hand slide, and click once, please, Liam, is actually some data and information from the 2017 Coastal Master Plan. The darker the blue, the deeper the water. This is for a 1% annual chance storm, specifically hurricanes. Our coastal sediments are really soft. They're eroding. Seas are rising. We are getting more vulnerable. On the right-hand side, you'll see some information from First Street Foundation that says that 42% 42.8% uh, of the individual properties in Louisiana are at any risk of flooding over the next 30 years. And out of that percentage, 43% of them are at major to extreme risk. So we understand that we're really flood prone. Next slide, please. And we also understand that our governance <laughs> systems aren't necessarily set up to be able to uh, have interjurisdictional collaboration. 
And so what this is that you're looking at right now, and I apologize for a couple of typos that are on this slide, uh, is, is a process that Region 7 as well as the other regions across the state are going through right now. We're, we're actually figuring out how do we work together across jurisdictions to create governance structures for watershed management. So in May of 2020, we brought together a group of stakeholders, the green dots, those are our advisory group meetings, the blue dots are region-wide workshops, so come one, come all, it's an open space. Um, and those pink ones are gonna actually be explicit opportunities for feedback. But we started with our vision and our values, we then started to think about challenges and opportunities. We thought about the four R's, and special shout out again to Dr. Thomas Douthat uh, for thinking about a governance structure framework. So specifically, what are the rules, responsibilities, <clears throat> um, and on and on specifically that we need to think about for that governance structure. We then reviewed a draft of a provisional governance recommendation, and now we're actually in this moment in time where we're collecting feedback from stakeholders. By the end of the summer, it is anticipated that we'll have a finalized structure for being able to, to think about how we're managing water um, in each of the eight regions across the state. Next slide, please. So what you're looking at in the bottom right-hand corner, um, and we call this meandering path specifically because there are a lot of challenges and opportunities. It's not a straight path, right? We have to you know, kind of curve around just like a river would in many different ways. So, in the lower right-hand corner, what you're seeing is a levee explosion, and I'll say this word for y'all, it's a Louisiana word, Carnarvon. Um, and specifically, the context of this is that in the flood of 1927, there was a decision made by some advisors in Louisiana specifically to blow the levees opposite from New Orleans to alleviate flood pressures. And historically, at that moment in time, it actually flooded out a parish called St. Bernard Parish as well as Plaquemines. And Judge Moreau at that point in time said, gentlemen, you have seen today the public execution of this parish. And this matters because this, this specific story lives in the generational narratives of Louisianans and their relationship with flood mitigation over time and how historically in the past government has interacted with that conversation. Uh, in a place like Louisiana and many, many other places, we've also seen this politicization of environment and climate where one word may actually be the make or break for certain conversations, being able to broker and negotiate deals that are important to governance and structures. We also know that these are wicked problems. So if you imagine a tangled ball of Christmas lights, we have a million different sectors all pulling in on at the same time and saying, I know how to solve this. But what we're gonna have to do is actually work together at the same time, bring those different sectors in, have interjurisdictional coordination and collaboration to pull all at the same time and to do it strategically. We also know that we are working to shift from a scarcity to an abundance mindset. Next slide, please. And so what do you see here, which is, which is perhaps an interesting um, discussion or maybe something that, that doesn't happen necessarily everywhere. In the bottom left-hand corner from the floods of August of 2016, what you see is some pretty significant flooding. Um, that's at Bayou Manshack, so where East Baton Rouge Parish meets Iberville Parish. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see some aqua dams that have been placed on Manshack Road ahead of Tropical Storm Barry in 2019. Click one, please. Oh, one more time. And what, what's really been happening here is, um, you see this, this quote from Everville Parish President at the time, and he said, I don't want to hurt anybody from East Baton Rouge, but in the same token, don't hurt our people in Everville. And so we're putting our elected officials and our staffers in really precarious situations where they're having to consider, okay, I'm going to have to actually do something that may negatively impact other people because folks who are upstream are not actually um, involving us in their upstream to downstream coordination conversations about water management. Next slide, please. And so I think one of the big um, challenges as well as opportunities that we have within the space is, as scientists, as practitioners, um, is, is where we can actually recognize that in some cases there, there is a stigma of, of science. Uh, there's a stigma sometimes that practitioners bring with them. It's not intentional, but um, I've, I've witnessed this personally uh, just over my career where there's elitism, and especially in a place like Louisiana where we uh, witness a lot of extraction, there's sometimes parallels that are drawn between research and application of best practices by practitioners and communities. And so I think one thing that I want to challenge us to, to do is to use science and best practices as a tool instead of a buffer. So how are we actually having our frontline communities, those with lived experience, inform the work that we are doing so that we are doing work that's in support of the lived experience of folks who in some cases have generationally uh, relevant lived experience 
And I think that we need to do that through transformational relationships that are not based on transactions, uh, because that's a much less extractive model. So how are we thinking about building relationships uh, very intentionally with communities in ways that we can create shared understandings and strategic solutions rooted in co-design methods that are actually informed and led by those who are most impacted? So I, I just want to challenge us, you know, whenever we don't live in the communities we're working in, I think it's our responsibility to consult the experts who live there. And that's what we're trying to do through the design of this governance structure in Region 7 for the Watershed Initiative. Next slide, and I think that's it. If you want to get in contact with Manny and I, our email addresses are there. And now I want to toss it over to Melissa Dickens. Thank you all. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Melissa Dickens. I am with the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. We're in the Tampa Bay area in Florida. And I'm going to wrap up today by talking through some of the nuts and bolts of implementation in comprehensive plans and making sure that the water resources language that is being crafted is something that is we, we can see through to implementation. And as an example, I'm gonna be using the one water plan update that was prepared for Hillsborough County. Next slide, please. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of implementation, want to provide some context about our agency and the relationship to Hillsborough County. The Planning Commission is an independent planning agency that is responsible for the long range and comprehensive planning for the four local governments in Hillsborough County. And as part of this project, we worked very closely with the technical experts and water resource professionals that work for Hillsborough County government. And Hillsborough County, you can see here on the slide, is uh, located, uh, it is the, the county where Tampa is located. It's the third most populous uh, county in the state. The vast majority of the residents within this county live within the unincorporated area, and it is growing. I think this stat here is probably even a little bit out of date with all of the relocations and moves that we've seen with COVID. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of growth and growth pressure. And then there is a robust water resources uh, planning uh, framework within Hillsborough County. So the, the folks at the county are working with all different aspects of water, potable water, wastewater, stormwater, and then aquifer recharge and resource protection. Next slide. And the One Water Comprehensive Plan update was the first phase of our overall comprehensive plan update. And we wanted to uh, use one of the examples that Aaron cited and create a water element. So we wanted to take all of the uh, disparate and siloed water resources related language that was found throughout the comprehensive plan and um, uh, consolidate it, synthesize it, make sure that it uh, that the different aspects of water were talking to each other and create one water, a, a one water chapter within the comprehensive plan. So we wanted that language to reflect the interrelated nature of water, wanted to set it up in a way that it would create a framework for new county initiatives and county projects. We wanted to make sure that it reflected the best practices in both planning and water resources management and was coordinated with other aspects of planning within the community. And most importantly, and, and I wanna highlight this, we wanted this to be an implementable and useful document. So there, are a lot of times where I've seen planners over the course of my career create really beautiful language. It's, you know, it, it could be published um, uh, on the national stage, but then in terms of actually getting it implemented, the comprehensive plan just sits on the shelf. And I would say that the comprehensive plans are only as good as um, the implementation. And so we really wanted to make implementation a focus for this effort. Next slide. And looking at One Water and Water Resources language, we first mapped out how we thought different aspects of the plan could be implemented. And this falls into a few different buckets. So implemented through regulations and ordinances, through capital projects and different projects that the water resources professionals have planned, through education and outreach, and through other programmatic elements that were the responsibility of county departments. Next slide. 
And so in working to create language that was implementable, the first step that we took, and I think the most important step, was making sure to involve the professionals who are responsible for implementation early in the process. And I can't underscore enough the importance of having good direction from the elected officials and also the senior leadership team, um, both for the, the, the planning department, but then also for the senior leadership of uh, the water resources aspects of the county. So the public works director, public utilities director, getting that buy-in at the top is really critical in creating a framework and guiding principles to guide the project. And from there, we, went about creating a multidisciplinary technical expert working group and this was a uh, a very robust we were very we were not conservative about who was included in the working group we wanted to make sure that anyone who was responsible for doing implementation was involved or aware of the project preferably involved um, and in terms of setting that up the first thing we did was to really communicate how a comprehensive plan can be a tool for technical experts. So it's it's not a plan that sits on a shelf. Uh, we want it to be something that is a resource for water resources professionals that they can point to for grants, can point to for, um, for code changes that need to occur, can point to as they're updating the CIP. And so we made sure to communicate that value and communicate the, um, the resource that a comprehensive plan can be. We say in our organization that we that all planners should have trusted laypersons to review uh, draft language and ensure that it it makes sense. Uh, we we also think that having trusted technical experts is really critical, and that's critical critical for a couple of reasons. First, of course, making sure that the language is understood by people who are not planners, but also making sure that um, the, the draft language that perhaps we saw another community use or was recognized through APA or another organization, making sure that that is something that will actually work for the individual community. It's important to get the expertise of engineers, of regulators, of the, the people who are really on the ground. And that speaks to making sure that the folks who are implementing the comprehensive plan are involved. Um, uh, I've seen over the, the course of my career in comprehensive planning, sometimes draft language is sent to department directors or sent to uh, senior leadership who perhaps are not as involved in the day-to-day -day implementation. And so making sure that uh, those professionals are involved as part of the process early on was really critical. And again, we wanted to not just send them drafts and have them review it, but make sure that they were reviewing and contributing to language as it is developed. Next slide. And once we did go through and develop that language, we went through policy by policy and mapped out how it would be implemented. And this took a couple of different forms. So first we created this matrix where we wanted to see exactly how the policies would play out um, once we got to the implementation phase. And one really important thing that I think that uh, planners don't often consider is the, the cost. So we wanted to highlight upfront whether there were any new known additional costs to the county and make sure that we were communicating that. Uh, fiscal sustainability is very important and we want to make sure that we're being good stewards of our financial resources and so making sure to identify and communicate if that was something to be considered that was the first step and then we went through and looked at how these policies might be implemented was it something that the board of county commissioners would implement through a change to the ldc or uh, adoption of the capital improvements program um, we also looked at aspects of implementation that would directly involve staffs, whether that was technical manual modifications or development of the CIP projects or other programmatic elements, and then looking at uh, areas of implementation that might be more around communication or advocacy, 
And we did this for each of the policies that were developed. And if we went across this matrix and didn't see anywhere where uh, something could be implemented, then it was removed from the One Water chapter. So we made sure that everything that we were developing was able to actually have a home in implementation. Next slide. The other thing that we did is made sure to have transparency and clarity on what was being changed. We had an adopted comprehensive plan, and now as part of the update, we're consolidating and creating a new One Water chapter. And we wanted to make sure that there was transparency, not only for the technical expert working group, but also for folks in the community who might be affected by the changes. And so we created, uh, we called them crosswalks, where we showed uh, the, the adopted elements in order and the new One Water chapter in order and showed how the policies were developed. So for example, you can see that here on the screen, we show how we're breaking out different policies from stormwater into One Water. And we also identified whether things were being, you know, the concepts were being retained as is, whether there were minor modifications, substantive modifications, or if it was being deleted entirely. And then for the One Water chapter, we identified where the policies came from. Did these come from adopted uh, a language that currently exists or did policies, were they, new, were they entirely new? And if they were new, what was the intent for creating them? Next slide. And before we move forward into the details of One Water, um, I did want to share some of the things that we learned in coordinating with the water resource professionals and things that were really helpful in ensuring that we had a really nice collaboration and um, uh, end product. So I mentioned this earlier, but making sure to understand and share how comprehensive plans can help to achieve technical goals. I think that's really important because it helps ensure that there's buy-in and that the water resource professionals see the, the value of the comprehensive plan and how it can be a resource for them. We also took the time to look at other documents that might be helpful in understanding the perspectives of the department. These were things like master plans or project lists and trying to understand upfront what the priorities and the uh, the future plans were for water resources. That was extremely helpful in that we could be proactive in crafting policies that would help to implement some of those items. And it also provided a more robust perspective for us as policymakers in understanding the perspective. Um, the next few bullets relate to making sure to be sensitive to the time. Uh, of the other folks who are part of the technical working group, making sure to uh, do the heavy lifting in terms of the research and best practices and not just asking you know, the, the folks who are involved in, in potable water to send uh, potable water examples, but really doing that work um, uh, from the planner side help to, to conserve time. Uh, we also made sure to have regular communication with all parties and also asked up front what the preferred method of communication was. Having those conversations up front was very helpful. Um, this next uh, item I think is important because sometimes I think people are reticent to provide critical feedback. You know, everyone wants to be positive and everyone wants to um, make sure that there's good working relationships, but it's really helpful to state up front that we're looking for critical feedback. We're looking for you all to, to poke holes in this and tell us why it won't work or why it can't be implemented. And that grants uh, permission for people to feel comfortable speaking up and sharing when there's an issue or um, a concern with a policy. We also tried to be understanding of the technical experts uh, demands and schedules. So it's very rainy here in the summer in Florida. And so we did not schedule all of our in-depth stormwater discussions during the summertime because there's a good chance that uh, the stormwater engineers are going to be um, occupied with other issues. And then we finally, we found that the collaborative approach of sharing the One Water Plan with senior leadership and with the board was very successful because they, the senior leadership team knew that it had been vetted by the 
technical professionals, the Board of County Commissioners had that understanding as well, and that helped move the whole project forward. Next slide. Um, so this slide shows the ultimate goals that we came up with for One Water. I'm not going to go too much into depth on them because I do have a slide that has a link to the full plan, but we wanted to create language that encompassed the full spectrum of water resources in Hillsborough County and make sure that we were speaking to different aspects of water resources and also coordinating it with other aspects of planning. And so those six goals that you see on the screen are how we put together a plan and a framework that accomplish those objectives. Next slide. And in terms of how this process played out, we did have unanimous adoption by the BOCC in October of 2020. We had a significant public and stakeholder outreach effort to um, ensure that the, the needs and the desires of the community were reflected in the language. Um, that is, is probably a whole separate presentation. I wanted to focus today on the technical, coordinating with technical experts, but making sure that there is input and um, uh, suggestions and recommendations from the community is a whole other part of making sure that there is a successful plan and that was something that we did as well with this uh, with this project. Um, because of the collaboration and coordination with technical experts, this is something that's been highlighted as a model here in Tampa Bay and it's been uh, featured in both agriculture and environmental publications, which is not always something you see. Um, and we are seeing some implementation happening already. So we're already seeing the septic to sewer program go, go into place and the green infrastructure technical manual. So those are some early uh, views of implementation that we are beginning to see. Next slide. And I'll close out with this additional information. You can contact me if there are any questions on this project. You can also take a look at our project page, which is at planhillsboroughorg slash one water, which has a full description of the language, the crosswalks, um, how we went about this approach and this process. And there's a lot to dig into there. And so I'll leave you with that. Um, and I think we are going to go ahead and turn it over to Mary Ann for final questions and wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Aaron, Manny, Rachel, and Melissa for a terrific presentation. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the Alliance for Water Efficiency for being willing to host this webinar free of charge for us. So we're at the point now where I think we're ready for your questions. Uh, thanks to the attendees for hanging in here with us. Uh, if you have questions, please type them in. Uh, we'll answer them. Um, and while Liam is looking at the questions, uh, you can email him if your question has not been answered due to time constraints. We've We've got about a little less than 10 minutes to, a um, little more than 10 minutes to do questions. So if we don't get to your question, you can email uh, him and we will get the answer from the speakers, but hopefully we'll be able to get through all the questions. Um, we're gonna make available a PDF of this combined presentation and also a link for the webinar recording. That'll be available in a few days and will be posted on the Alliance webinar page. And you can sign up for regular news and events from the Water and Planning Network at, as Bill mentioned earlier, the water at planning.org. Um, Bill and I maintain this mailing list and we, we urge everyone to sign up. Just make sure you save water at planning.org as a safe sender so that our newsletters don't go to your junk folder. Um, so I uh, just wanted to give a plug there. And then lastly, because our, our host has been so kind to host these for us free of charge, you can sign up for regular water efficiency news and events at uh, that uh, uh, URL there, the Alliance for Water Efficiency.org. So I think we're ready, Liam, for questions, and um, we'll see what we've got here. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for great presentations. Uh, the first question looks like uh, maybe anybody could weigh in on it. Uh, they're asking, what are uh, what what are water equity initiatives that are most commendable and the best strategies to implement more? sure if anybody has a thought on that. Yeah, this, this is Rachel Sanderson. I'll, I'll speak to that. 
Um, so I think for some from water equity initiatives, um, I think any initiative that comes to mind for me where frontline communities, those who are most impacted by water challenges are actually leading the conversation and or controlling the resources. So if you think of community control funds, for example, I think those are really great examples of equitable models to be able to do the work. Um, something that's more climate related, I think is uh, Gulf South for Green New Deal, which is being hosted by Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy and, and a couple of other Gulf South groups. I, I'll chime in just to piggyback off of Rachel's. I think the, the other component of not going to specifics, but as we're you know being introduced to a world that we're trying to be more inclusive and equitable, I think the other part about all this is having a sense of belonging. I think what was talked about today by all of us was, and especially in the case of um, with um, Ms. Melissa's presentation, is that how are you being intentional about making sure that there's a lay person who's able to understand it and, and have the opportunity to provide feedback as well as uh, to the technical and having all those conversations uh, being valued. And same thing as, as um, understanding all the different players as, um, as Erin mentioned in, in her comprehensive research report, that you have to understand whose voices should be at the table and have the space if someone's not there so they can pull a chair up. I had just one more thought, and it's that I think water equity can look really different depending on your community's context. So it covers anything from water affordability to issues of flooding and frontline communities on, you know, the actual banks of flooding events to water scarce communities and the actual water provision in a clean and affordable manner. So I think when looking at uh, water equity for your own community, it's important to think about the methods of doing so, but also to really hone in on what specifically the equity issues are so you can ensure that the right stakeholders are at the table and that the methods line up with the issue you're trying to uh, correct. All right, thank you. And someone's asking, uh, what are the best ways to pay for accommodating or adapting to sea level rise? And this looks like it might be directed toward Melissa. Thanks. Um, so we have a separate um, sea level rise strategy that's handled through our coastal management element. Um, in, and I will say that in Florida, there are a number of uh, communities that are looking at sea level rise and examining that as part of their comprehensive plans. Particularly, the, the leaders in this area are down in South Florida. There's a South Florida uh, climate uh, consortium that is doing a lot of really interesting work related to comprehensive planning as well as actual implementation. For example, you've probably heard of the city of Miami Beach raising their sidewalks. I've been down there recently and they, they truly are uh, doing that. So in terms of um, a Florida model, we generally tend to look to South Florida um, and, and looking at some of their documents and planning would probably give a, a good uh, idea of how to start to examine some of the costs and uh, strategies to help pay for that. Yeah, this is Bill right. Sesnick. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit. Um, I, we've been working on a project here in New Jersey in the Atlantic City region and um, regarding coastal resilience. And one of the issues that, that has come up is this exact issue of financing. And what we're seeing is um, that there is extensive cost sharing for many projects uh, between federal, state, and local governments. And they all have different levels of resources. Um, and there are also very different scales of cost um, the Army Corps and the federal agencies tend to look at large macro scale projects, whereas local governments are looking at how they can participate to resolve more immediate frequent flooding and, and other, um, you know, more local issues. But ultimately, we're looking at how we can begin to tease out participation by all the parties um, to begin to formulate an integrated plan, um, you know, that is affordable for everyone. This is a significant challenge, though, because um, you know, most of these under federal financing require cost-benefit analysis, um, 
which uh, puts you in, in uh, many kinds of boxes um, with respect to feasibility of projects. All right, thank you. Uh, and let's say another one from Melissa. Uh, what is the expected impact of saltwater intrusion to the aquifer from sea level rise for Hillsborough County? It looks like that's a similar question. Yeah. So, um, so they, I do, I am not a technical expert on saltwater intrusion um, and the aquifer. However, what I can point you to um, is. The Southwest Florida Water Management District has the Southern Water Use Caution Area, and they look at saltwater intrusion in the aquifer. Hillsborough County also has um, a couple of projects that are designed to combat saltwater intrusion, the South Hillsborough Aquifer Recharge Project being one of them. And um, in terms of the, the data on that, I would suggest looking at either of those two sources to get some more information as to how the saltwater interface is moving, how climate change is impacting that, and what the uh, outlook looks like. But um, unfortunately, I am only an AICP and uh, not necessarily qualified to speak to the, the technical details of that. Thanks. All right, thanks, Melissa. Uh, comment and question for Rachel. Uh, thank you for recognizing the value of people with lived experience as experts in our planning process. Uh, in your experience with building transformational relationships, how can you uh, can you share some examples of how you can have co-designed and or allowed these people with lived experience to actually lead the planning process and not just be part of it? Yes, absolutely. I adore this question. I cannot see who asked it, but thank you. Um, so not currently specifically in the work that I'm doing right now at this moment in time, but um, in, in some previous work that I've done, I, one way that this was done where we were really incorporating people's lived experience on the front end was, was kind of to through, through similar programs. So specifically Foundation for Louisiana had some initial investments to work with communities in Plaquemines Parish, which is, um, if you think of where the Mississippi River meets the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it's very, very vulnerable to climate change, sea level rise, erosion, on and on and on. Um, and essentially that was an initial investment to be able to work with residents of Plaquemines Parish to create a planning process for a plan. Uh, so the, the comment was by the time that they see a plan, all the decisions have already been made. And I, I think most of us recognize that to be true. So they created a planning process. Um, that document was then actually leveraged into the LA Safe planning process, so Louisiana's Strategic Adaptations for Future Environments. Uh, so a community co-design process was then leveraged into a community co-design workshopping space that then also identified and recognized and leveraged a program that came out of that same resident-based initiative out of Plaquemines Parish called Lead the Coast. And specifically what that was was a training where individuals across Southeast Louisiana, specifically in BIPOC communities, were invested in to be able to go through a training, to be paid to go through that training. Child care was also offered, transportation were necessary as well, and food was provided to be able to actually have people speak to their lived experience. And then at the same time saying, okay, now we have pres presenters and speakers to come in and say, yeah, that scientific data and information that, that you're, you're talking about, really, there, we have a lot of supporting evidence for that. Um, and so I think those are two really interesting efforts that have, have done well in that model. All right. Thank you, Rachel. I believe this one's for Melissa. They say, great presentation. Perhaps I missed it, but the development of the governance structure, who would be the ultimate leader of the result or the resulting framework? So the, the, the planning commission took the lead on drafting the policy language uh, with the support of the technical experts and water resources professionals. That then was approved and adopted by the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners. So the, the, the we took the lead on developing the policy document then that was adopted by the BOCC. And so now it's being implemented by uh, the county departments and staff. All right, great. And uh, this looks like one that everyone might be able to weigh in on. Uh, are there examples of indigenous water management practices being incorporated into water management plans in Colorado, Florida, or other places in the contiguous U.S.?
I'll take a stab at that. And I'll say specifically in Colorado, I'm not necessarily aware of that. I can say in Arizona, I don't think it's coordinated efforts between municipalities and tribal governments, um, but some local plans do reference the water sharing agreements that uh, many communities in the Phoenix Valley especially have with communities such as the Gila River Indian community. Um, and that's the extent that I've seen it thus far, but I think this is certainly an area for folks, especially that are neighbors of tribal communities to uh, continue to work on and improve going forward. And I think related to that are some regional planning efforts. Um, again, and this is speaking to like the communities in the Phoenix Valley, uh, the West Valley communities of like Glendale, Avondale and the like are specifically working to restore the Salt River and make that a livable and walkable space. And that is being done in partnership with the Gila River Indian community as well as um, some urban waters federal grant money. All right. Um, and just one more question, uh, and just real quick to the couple of folks who asked about if we'll be sending out the uh, presentation, we will be following up to all the registrants with the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint. So if you'd like to access any links or, or anything that was uh, mentioned in the presentations, you'll be able to do it that way. And I imagine you'll be able to use that to uh, you know, self-report CEs because somebody asked about that as well. Uh, and the last question that we have right now is, uh, each, uh, each state has a FEMA approved state hazard plan, SHP. I'm interested in your thoughts about FEMA requiring the local comprehensive plan and SHP uh, have a licensed planner to sign off to uh, indicate the mitigation targets funded by taxpayers. Does that align with local built and mitigation project measures? I'll speak kind of generally and just say that I think there are a lot of opportunities for integration between FEMA requirements and local planning in general. So the comprehensive plan would be a great connection point, but then there's all the water utility and water management agency planning activities as well that would, I would think, especially benefit from better connection with FEMA planning. Um, yeah, as you kind of allude to in your question, I think it depends on the structure of that. Um, so a local planner uh, from the planning agency or someone in a similar position at a water management agency would be in a great position to uh, just ensure like consistency and coordination between these planning efforts. Um, but I think it is also about like the timing of the planning efforts and how much those coincide or not. Um, so anywhere between like these plans being updated at really different times, if the FEMA plan were to coordinate with like an old comprehensive plan that would kind of uh, dilute the opportunity a little bit, uh, you know, relying on old data and old management strategies. Uh, whereas if these things could be done kind of in coordination, that becomes obviously a little bit of a harder workflow to manage, but you can at least uh, better double up on the opportunities offered by these requirements. I would love to add to that. This is Rachel Sanderson. Um, I definitely agree with everything that Aaron has said, and I, and I do want to give Dr. Thomas Douthit with LSU, Louisiana State University, a shout out. He's been kind of interrogating this question a little bit, at least from the Region 7 perspective of the Watershed Initiative, where they've been doing a plan analysis of all plans that exist across that region, so both parish and municipal as well as regional up to state level. Um, and, and so what we're really seeing is that without that requirement from, from federal or state level, people are just not coordinating with one another. So I think there's a lot of benefit to being able to strategically braid and weave different planning processes from a strategic perspective, so perhaps stormwater management plans and programs being weaved into some of those FEMA hazmat plans, for example. Um, we can also say the same about coastal zone management. And then I think there's also a, a layer in between, and, and this is kind of the discussion in Louisiana, at least, and maybe some other places, where we're missing this regional layer. So maybe, especially for parishes and counties who don't have capacity to be able to hire a contractor or a consultant to actually implement on that work, 
being able to take that from a regional approach and then actually have that be adopted at the local level might be a way to actually strategically incentivize interjurisdictional coordination, as well as be able to free up some resources for communities to be able to implement on that. Okay, so Liam, is that the last question? That is the last one, yep. Okay, well, thank you all so much. I want to thank very much the speakers, Bill Sesenik, Aaron Ruglin, Manny Patoli, Rachel um, Sanderson, and Melissa Dickens for a great webinar. And um, if you haven't already, sign up for the Water and Planning Network email list at wateratplanning.org. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.